my view on that is that if it would be wrong to do those experiments on humans, it would also be wrong to do the experiments on animals. Otherwise, we consider considering humans to be superior to other sentient animals, and there's no moral or rational justification for that. We invited animal advocates from around the world to explore important and complex topics. Through respectful, solution-based dialogue, we attempt to find common ground. Welcome to the Battle of Ideas, Two Philosophies, One Movement episode of Common Ground. Now for those of you who watched my Three Attacks video, you'll know that this is an issue that's near and dear to my heart. Not because I'm necessarily that huge of a student of philosophy, but because it forms the core values of our movement, specifically through our language and our messaging. Now this was another one of our longer recordings, so it's going to be divided into multiple parts. I'm not actually sure how many parts yet, because to be honest with you, I'm still editing the thing. So be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram um, and subscribe to make sure you um, see those other parts. And it's also a nice way to stay connected with other animal advocates between the shows. On social media, you'll also be able to track when our next live show is so you can get involved in that. With that, let's start the show. As animal advocates, we want to advance the plight of our fellow animals as fast as possible. However, is the main philosophy that's currently influencing the welfare-focused animal movement, utilitarianism, the most effective? Or should we be focusing on a rights-based approach through our language and our campaigning? Is animal rights the main philosophy of the movement? The interesting thing about this question um, is it's going to lead to um, some talk about language and about, you know, are, are we talking about um, a philosophy here? Are we talking about labels? Uh, are we talking about uh, a convenient um, political shorthand, as um, Peter Singer would, would, would say, What's the difference between rights-based animal rights and widely defined animal rights? What I call rights-based animal rights uh, never seems to be able to gain a space within animal rights. And so I found that very frustrating over the years in the sense that I found a lot of people who don't adhere to the philosophy quite like the label. So there's a lot of ambiguity uh, in there. And then from the people who want to maybe explore um, Reagan type rights based animal rights, that can be very frustrating because you've got a dominant culture, which is called animal rights, but is not really adhering to the philosophy. That's really kind of the whole idea behind the show when we mm. um, started a couple of months ago, isn't it? To try to highlight the rights based approach and you know, why it is distinct. My understanding of the distinction between the widely defined um, animal rights and the rights based animal rights view is that when we're talking about a rights-based animal rights view, we're talking about people like Tom Reagan. Uh, we're talking about this deontological tradition that says that there are some absolute prohibitions against particular kinds of ways of intervening on the lives of uh, non-human animals. And then when I think about the, uh, the widely defined animal rights view, there I think we're talking more about the ways that it, it gets kind of used as a general catch-all term for all of the ways that um, advocates advocate in some way for the interests of non-human animals. So you might think about like the worst kind of ineffective welfare reform where we're going to slightly you know, increase the size of a cage that a chicken is living in, even though that's not actually going to do that much for the welfare of the individual. And it's actually just going to benefit the industry. And in the long run, those are not like, you know, you might think that in the long run, these are just not even good from a welfare perspective. Um, that might get lumped into this idea of widely defined animal rights. To me, widely defined is basically the movement and rights-based um, animal rights is specifically the Reagan rights, similar to what Aaron just said, that the, really the spirit behind the show, but it's a very specific <clears throat> framework. And anything that kind of slips into that welfare side of things, intentionally or not, really does kind of more, move more into that widely defined animal rights, where it's more just in name, not necessarily in practice, not necessarily talking about, you know, uh, rights violations and the rest of it. What is utilitarianism? Now, it's interesting here in the sense that um, a, a rights-based position would probably say that most of the movement is utilitarian. But it's, I think it's interesting in the sense that I'm not sure that most of the people in the movement would agree with that or kind of really understand what that meant. But when I first came into the movement, I wasn't necessarily that aware of the philosophy and it actually took some time to 
um, come across Reagan, fortunately, my first couple of years, I just kind of, you know, in a lot of ways mimicked others. And that became my advocacy approach. And it wasn't until I kind of took a step back and read the theory for myself that I really kind of revisited how to structure it and move towards more towards that rights-based approach. To me, it's really just a matter of looking at the, um, I guess from a negative utilitarian perspective, looking at the aggregate suffering and then basically doing um, to the best of our ability, some type of estimate as far as how we can do our do what we can to um, minimize the aggregate suffering um, and looking at the total number of individuals involved and then the total amount of suffering, somehow attaching values to that and then making decisions based off that. I mean, I think the Impossible Burger is a great example around this because they tested on 188 individuals to make the burger not just available, but more widely available for the market. So to me, some um, strands of utilitarianism would say that this was a good move because it had the uh, greater reduction in suffering, whereas from a rights-based perspective, where I would tend to lean is that those 188 individuals, it's not their fault that this company wants to market this burger and their rights are not to be violated and they're not to be killed through testing. And I know that Aaron's situation, I think is um, a general utilitarian position, Aaron, but not necessarily in total agreement with Singer. Uh, Would that be right? So the first way that utilitarian theories can differ is with respect to uh, what they take to be the good. So sort of this, this theory of good. Uh, but there's also differences with respect to the theory of right action. And what that's going to tell you about is like, should you be trying to maximize expected utility or should you be trying to um, maximize actual utility? And then there's one more crucial point, which I think is like needs, needs to be added to any discussion of utilitarianism. And this is to say that utilitarianism is not a theory of, of, uh, of practical deliberation. It's a theory about right action and a theory about the good. And what that means is that um, just because you're utilitarian, that does not mean that the way that you should calculate what to do is going to be the calculate utility, because we're often terrible at calculating utility. And so utilitarians from the time of Jeremy Bentham, um, from, you know, from the very beginning, have said that you know, to be utilitarian is not to go around saying, okay, here's my options, here's the utility associated with each of my options, now I'm going to perform the action that based on my own calculations right here in the moment, it seems like it's gonna to lead to the greatest overall utility. Because uh, often that's a terrible way of making decisions. Often that's gonna lead us to cook the data in our favor, to make bad calculations, stuff like that. And sort of throughout the history of utilitarian thought through, through Mill, through Sedgwick, through Hare, we get, and then through, through Singer, we get this refinement of this idea that um, you know, we, need, we need other work being done in terms of our theory of practical deliberation. So you can be utilitarian who thinks that the right action is the one that brings about the greatest overall utility and still think that the best way to bring about overall utility is to show respect for these um, absolute constraints against particular kinds of behaviors or to work on your virtues or to show care or, or things like that. Would, would, would that, last, that last type that you, you talked about normally be called rule utilitarian? No, and I don't think really utilitarians are really utilitarian, are, are actually utilitarians. I see them as, as deontologists. Uh, so rule utilitarianism is the view that what makes an action right is that it is consistent or, or that it is um, recommended by the rule that if everybody were to follow would lead to the greatest you know, overall social good or the greatest overall utility. Um, and to be clear, that's a different theory of right action than act utilitarianism. So act utilitarianism says that what makes an action right is that it actually brings about greater overall utility or it's expected to bring about greater overall utility. But the only real legitimate good versions of act utilitarianism are going to tell you that sometimes um, as a matter of practical liberation, you should not be calculating utility. Instead, you should be following, you should be following other sorts of principles. What is a rights-based approach and how is it different to utilitarianism? Maybe Roger, you and I can have a crack at just framing a rights-based approach real quickly. I mean, I know for me, it's I, perhaps the key difference is it's more bottom-up versus top-down. So really looking at the individual and their interests, um, because to me, a right's just a way of protecting an interest. And I think a lot of the, philosoph- the, the, the philosophies are, are in a lot of ways very similar. They're both incorporating interests it's just to me, it seems like most strands of utilitarianism focus on the aggregate interests 
versus the actual individual. Um, and there's the whole kind of empty receptacle, I guess, uh, thought process to counter utilitarianism that if, you know, viewing individuals as receptacles of suffering or pleasure um, versus a rights-based view really looks at the individual as an end in themselves and not necessarily their overall utility to the rest of the world. To me, the, the, the key difference is around our language and our messaging. I mean, Aaron touched on the welfare campaigns. I mean, welfare campaigns, I think from a utilitarian perspective, make sense because then they're designed at least to reduce suffering. But that's to me where a rights-based approach is really just matter, you know, it's a matter of strict justice to end the use of other animals. What language is associated with each of these philosophies? A lot of it is to do with the language that is used. Um, I, I always focus on that as a sociologist because um, sociologists tend to see social movements as claims makers in civil society. I think what you, what you get a lot at the moment is you, you're, you're getting a lot of, um, uh, you know, a kind of welfare language with a vegan label attached to it, but there's not necessarily uh, a consistency of, of views. Whereas I tend to think that the rights-based position is stronger. Um, it's more definitive. And it's, you know, based, based on saying that, or you're trying to uh, get people to agree with the proposition that other animals are rights bearers and then our use of them becomes a rights violation. And I tend to think that that's a lot stronger than using welfare language about cruelty or mercy or even being animal lovers. Not, not, none of that really um, would apply necessarily to a, a rights-based view you know, you don't, you don't need to talk in those terms, whereas most of the movement tends to. And I think that's why uh, most of the movement in Francione's terms uh, are, he would, he would say that the movement is a welfare movement, or he would then say um, it's an animal confusion movement in the sense that its means and its ends are not necessarily aligned, which is one of the things that um, Reagan was also uh, concerned about, basically saying that our means needs to be consistent with our ends and complaining really that they're not, you know, and that, and that is um, reflected by the language that we use. We, we can talk about um, campaigns of these large organizations all we want, but to me as individuals, that this is really, to me, the difference between the two approaches. What do each of these philosophies have to say about the impossible burger and the other animals who are killed through testing for it? The impossible burger, um, where um, experiments animals were were carried out in the development of that hmm. and um, the question of, of whether that was right or, or wrong uh, and that people might argue from a utilitarian perspective it was okay because it results in all these burgers being available for vegans and more people might go vegan. Um, my view on that is that if it would be wrong to do those experiments on humans it would also be wrong to do the experiments on animals otherwise we're consider considering humans to be superior to other sentient animals and there's no moral or rational justification for that and that would be the argument really against all animal experiments and that's that's how I, how i'd approach that issue now where that fits in um whether that's like a rights-based approach or some other approach i don't know but that's how i would argue against uh, those experiments yeah well i mean it, it... It, it uh, raises a movement issue that um, the likes of uh, John Curtin and Mel Broughton and uh, even Jake Conroy and that are, are, are raising, which is that the focus has gone off vivisection. And so it's almost like uh, in the movement, it's almost like a forgotten issue now. And so we do seem to, um, to have some, as it were, vivisection supporting people in the movement, which is, which is an interesting one. And it'll certainly come to the fore, I'm sure, when we start to think in terms of um, the vaccine that is, is now being you know, pushed through laboratories globally. You know, that's, that's, that's gonna be a contentious issue, I would have thought. Is the impossible burger really gonna lead us towards, you know, what we wanna call it, animal liberation? Mm -hmm or respect for all animals and their rights. But if I was had those 188 individuals sitting in front of me, I'd have a really hard time saying, you know what, you know, in the, the vivid section, the way, you know, as you pointed out, Roger, they say, oh, we have to sacrifice you for the greater good. I just, I have a hard time <laughs> resonating with that. And I think that's really the core thing is translating the, the philosophy to the actual application of the movement. And I think that's a great example of the distinction between the rights-based or deontological perspective and that utilitarian perspective that 
alleges that it's going to be better for the overall good if we do kill those individuals through testing. I was wondering if I could just read a quick quote by Peter Singer. So he goes, um, this is from his uh, New York Review of Books debate with Tom Reagan. So he goes, in fact, thinking still the social practice of experimentation as a whole and not of individual cases, good utilitarian arguments could be offered for the immediate abolition of animal experimentation. The suffering animals to be spared would be immense. The benefits lost at best uncertain. And the incentive thus provided for the speedy development of alternative means of conducting research, the most powerful imaginable. And I think the, the reason why I just want to add that is that um, I think there's this assumption that the decision procedure that the utilitarian is going to re recommend is to go through each case and say, okay, in this case, do I think that this will lead to more suffering or, or less suffering? Um, and that just need not be the decision principle. It might be better off. We might be better off for overall utility. Um, and there's good utilitarian thinking to suggest this. If instead of doing that procedure, we just said, we're going to get rid of all, you know, animal experimentation of this sort. Um, so it, it, it very well may be the case that the utilitarian and the rights view are going to be in complete agreement with respect to the, um, the impossible burger, uh, simply because they're going to, they're going to agree that, uh, that would be better overall. Reagan and uh, Singer clashed over something that Singer said in relation to um, an interaction he had with uh, a vivisector called Aziz. I think Ronnie might re remember this, where where uh, Singer did say that um, you know there, there would there would be a circumstance where you know the the benefit is is so great that um, animal experimentation therefore would, would be morally justified. At, at the same time, he does put a lot of kind of um, you know bridges and walls and caveats to, to, to get to get there. So a kind of animal use is um, is in the mix, though, isn't it? You no, know, for for Singer. I want to argue categorically against the vast majority of animal experimentation. Um, the only stuff I'd want to allow would be purely therapeutic stuff, where like a dog breaks their arm naturally, the dog goes in, they're thick, they're helping the dog through normal veterinary procedures, and they're gaining some knowledge at the same time. Um, so I, th I think that like the, you could be a utilitarian and support these broad prohibitions that go beyond Singer because you think that the social consequences of promoting those prohibitions uh, with no, ex no room for exceptions left into the decision procedure is just going to lead to a better, a better world. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Common Ground. As always, be sure to leave your thoughts in the comments. I really enjoy hearing what others think. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Instagram and subscribe so that you know when the next live show is and so that you can become aware when the edited versions are released. I've also got some brand new fun content on the way where I read animal rights philosophy to the residents at Friend. We're also trying to use the Animal Rights Show as a platform so as many voices can be heard as possible. So if you're able to use the Facebook Invite Friends feature and invite fellow advocates you might know who may be interested in these topics, it would really help us out. Thanks for watching, stay safe, and we'll see you in the next one.